Hello and welcome to The Shakedown. Our mission is to inform people about how the criminal justice system works, the real people impacted by the justice system, and methods to improve justice through compassionate and casual conversation. Hosts of The Shakedown share over 50 years of combined personal experience dealing with Texas prisons and working to change the criminal justice system. And now, here's our show. doing any of that, then what's the point of having it? Well, you know, I look at the misdemeanor courts and I'm wondering why do we even have them? I mean, looked at, you know, looked at a month over Harris County a couple of years ago and over 90 something percent of the cases that were disposed of for the month were just dismissed. I mean, you know, if 90 something percent of the misdemeanor cases for a month are dismissed, are we picking on people or we're wasting people's time. It looks like to me, we're just doing a paper shuffle and then paying off an attorney a huge sum of money to dismiss a case. Why file the case in the first place? Isn't that what we're doing in California? That's now what we're doing in Houston. Um, I mean, who, we shouldn't be shocked. Crimes increasing. I, that, and then here's another thing. Like I was looking at getting ready, ready for this too, about, about are, are we helping like is this going to help overall is that so if you look at first world countries and you look at australia canada denmark france germany japan norway sweden united kingdom all right one prisoners per hundred thousand people they like we we have 505 per hundred thousand people United Kingdom, which is the, or sorry, no, Australia, which is the next highest on the list, has 165. So we're way above that, which means we should be safer. Like we should be the safest place around. Yeah. As long as we have crime increasing, we need we need more capacity. Uh, that's kind of hard to say. Look, the reason why we have all this stuff going on in California is because they won't build more prison. I mean, they had a court order them to reduce their prison population because they couldn't provide me uh, proper medical care. It didn't have anything to do with uh, whether they were innocent or whether they were going to commit more crime. That's just what the federal courts ordered. They went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court 20 years ago, and they said, you know, the dissent said we cannot be sanctioning uh, ordering a state to release criminals. And uh, – that was the minority then. Those are the majority now. So that result would not be the same. The problem is they have an unwillingness in California to build additional jail space. And as a result, everything they're doing in California is to reduce the jail population. We cannot be shocked that crime is going up when they're making stupid arguments. We're going to release more people from jail and that's going to make us safer. No, common sense says we release more people from jail. Crime will go up. And what do you know? Crime is going up. We're just not crawling at crime anymore because we're not prosecuting theft under $950. So what good is just locking up? I see what you're saying there. Say again? But you know, we take it. Oh, go ahead, Dave. I mean, what good is that going to do? So you're just going to keep locking people up. So then, you you know, so the states get more free labor and just and people just get more hardened. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, what what is... There's no solution there. That's not a solution. Okay, well, but what is the solution then? Or is the solution that we're going to just have, uh, we're going to, I mean, okay, so the solution is the police officers told uh, uh, people in, in Canada recently, put your car keys next to your front door because when people are doing break-ins at your house, the, all they're wanting is the car. And so just give it to them. Is that the solution? I mean, in Texas, we have the castle doctrine. So if you break into my house, I can kill you. I can kill you to protect my castle. I don't have to kill you because you're using lethal force on me. I can just shoot you because you're inside my castle. That's not the law in other in, in the a lot of our urban areas. And so, what is the solution? Just to allow people to commit more crime? The pro we need to cr change the mindset. Crime will go down when we put accountability in back into the system. There, there's a case called Sanchez versus um, Alabama where they had to live under one of these. Um, injunctions for four or five years where they couldn't hold anybody accountable. The judge said, you, the court of appeals said you just had to release people. 
And it was ultimately reversed. And I, I had the judge, I mean, the sheriff on my podcast, he said, look, we started getting crime to decrease, but we had to reinstitute a system of accountability and and have punishment or penalties when people didn't show up for court. And after, after around six months, crime started increasing. So we are decreasing. So we've got to change the mindset. Now, when we do it, there may be some increase for a period of time but after that crime will go back down the problem we have right now is we've got people saying there's no accountability funny. what i'm sorry i didn't i think that a change in mindset is one of the things i i kind of fear the most though uh because i mean mindsets can whenever they start swinging you stand and, and you you stand at the at the one end of, of a pendulum and i stand at the other pretty much but what whenever it starts to shift in your direction it, it, it tends to um, it cause you, you get a lot more abuses by police officers. You get a lot more. You know what? People, I agree with you on that. When the pendulum swings, it swings really hard to the extremes. And you know whose fault that is? Who's that? It's my fault when it swings up to the hard left. And when it swings to the hard right, it's the hard left's fault because of their unwillingness to compromise. They could be compromising right now as the pendulum is starting to swing right. But they're saying, no, no, we're not going to do it. And we don't even agree there's a problem. The president of the United States came out and said crimes at a 50-year low in his State of the Union uh, address. I, I mean, know. the NAACP I'm in Oakland doesn't agree with that. I'm agreeing with you. I'm, starting to, <laughs> I'm really starting to see your point of view on this. <laughs> so, no, I, I, what you said right there, I agree with. And the whole thing about the mindset thing, I mean, even though I get scared whenever it, goes, whenever it swings up, I do agree that the mindset is the issue. And I think that if what you said earlier about the court is supposed to just be applying just that much pressure, that just the right amount of pressure to get you to change. I totally agree with that. And that's the way I've always seen it. It's this whole throw people away thing that I disagree with. Well, this is where we should end. I mean, I've got somebody completely agreeing with me. <laughs> no, so we, have to, we have to be done right now because it can go nowhere but down from here. But no, Malone, I thank you very much for those comments. I mean, I, I, I work very hard to try, to try to find common ground. I was on a, uh, a, a debate with somebody from, you know, the, the far left and uh, we couldn't find common ground. She called jails cages and she was calling me racist by the end because she knew I was making my points. And she was, she was making arguments just to cut off debate. She was using toxic language. And so I, I want to thank yeah. you for that. I, I work hard not to uh, cut off debate and try to find common ground. And so that's why well, I think we, we should be fair here and, and on this uh, podcast, we, we seek the truth. We don't, we ain't trying to, push an agenda just for the sake of the agenda. We're not trying to be right for the sake of being right. Look, I mean, we're always, I'm always looking for ways to improve the, the system. You know, one of the things that we've proposed at our legislature was, you know, if you're still in jail after 72 hours, then you need to be remagistrated. Somebody needs to figure out why you're still in jail. Um, I mean, you shouldn't be in jail after 72 hours. And so if you are, then somebody needs to take you for a judge and say, why are you still here? All right. I like that idea. <laughs> I, and i and i like the the big thing is i like having like i really do like having conversations like this where we can like one thing i really didn't think about i like having conversations that, where you actually have a conversation <laughs> yeah but like yeah. We, uh, but i like the, <laughs> the the fact that like i didn't think about until we had this con we'll talk, start talking about this like a lot of things if there are any changes a lot of times it's a lot of things have to change at once and they have to be coordinated and well thought out, which is difficult in any, in any sort of system like we have. And if it's not, then you end up with this. We lost uh, with, with, yeah, yeah. You I keep thinking David's froze too, but he's just looking in the same spot. <laughs> <laughs> he still doesn't say anything. I know. Stone I know. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan, you keep, cut, you, you keep cutting out, Ryan. It's, you know, you, education, if you, it just starts with you've got a lot of people that are impoverished who aren't getting education and, you know, and they live in rough neighborhoods, have brothers, uncles, aunts, everybody that's gone to prison and they don't really stand a chance, you know, but you also, some of the greatest athletes in sports come from impoverished families because they wanted a way out. You know, and I, I'm a perfect example that my grandfather was a sharecropper and my parents were the first ones in their 
families to go to college. And my, we were poor growing up. My parents were public school teachers. My mom had four kids in two years and five months because my sisters are twins. And so, I mean, we grew up very poor. Uh, and But they always taught me education is the ultimate equalizer. And so and my mom and I used to watch Perry Mason on Sunday nights from 1035 to 1135. And so... I decided I wanted to go to law school. And you know what? I didn't get in the first time because I always worked. And so my grades suffered. And so I had, I got my master's degree, which you mentioned at the beginning, to help me go to law school. And so I was old, you know, older than the normal student when I went to law school. But it's something I, I had a grandfather tell me as I was applying to go to law school the second time. He's like, when are you going to give up this pipe dream, kiddo? <laughs> oh, well, I didn't give it up. And you know what? I got in. And I did well in law school. And I've been, you know, out of law school for 30 something years. And so, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what makes people in the same family different. I don't know what makes one person reckless and, and have a car accident and then get hooked on drugs. Another, you know, dislike their family and another one, you know, has uh, issues, other issues. And then, you know, I'm a workaholic. I mean, I've, <laughs> I'm a workaholic because I'm the classic middle child. I'm always trying, trying, trying to show my parents who have passed now that that i'm worthy of their love because i was the middle child uh, and so I, there's i mean you know what i'm a strong christian and so i, ju- I do believe that life is not easy i mean my, i have a child my youngest child was had a bone marrow transplant when she was five and so i mean I, life is just the most difficult scariest ride you can get on at one of these Disneyland Six Flags and you know your faith is what helps you get through that stupid ride um, you know if you put me on the teacups at any of these carnivals I'm going to be thrown up but uh, I survived you know a grandfather committing suicide and a daughter having a bone marrow transplant and uh, and we look at some of those memories as we cherish and we look at some of those memories that we cannot bring out of the box even to this day because they hurt so much. That's part of life and how people handle it. I mean, I just look at people and I go, but for the grace of, grace of God, there go I. Uh, and uh, I don't know what makes me different than someone else. I don't know what makes you different or, or Malone different or Ryan different than someone else. Um it's just what it is. I think we just, we, we forget that we're here for just the blink of an eye. I mean, I blinked and I'm 63 years old. I mean, my grandmother died when she was 63. Here I am at 63. My, my mom was scared to death the whole year she turned 63. She thought it was her time to turn, die because her mom died. She ended up living till 80 and she had a car accident. And so here I am at 63, the age when my grandmother died. And I'm like, wow, where did time go? But the thing is, I'm not done. I have a lot of other stuff planned to do. And, you know, I just have enjoyed the ride. I've, uh, and we have to just, if we don't like the way we're going, change and redirect. I think that's what a lot of people have problems with. Um, and I think we didn't, we just touched on it. Mental illness is such a really, really bad thing. And I don't know how we address that in society because we're not addressing it uh, properly. But the answer can't be we don't give treatment and we just have to deal with these people uh, and put up with whatever they end up doing. I don't think that's the answer either. I, I can agree with that. I also don't think that sending them to jail where they're not getting any treatment either is a, is a good idea. I don't either. But, you know, also, it's really bad what we're currently doing. They get out of jail. They get off their meds. They start causing problems. They get arrested. They get into jail. They get back on their meds. They get, you know, their hand. They can be it's handled. Like, it's it's a, cycle. a big cycle. Just, and, I've, I've seen it. <laughs> well, it, it's one of those things that if we could figure out the answer to that, we could all be billionaires. <laughs> that. <laughs> I, they, when I th- look back at all of the, like, prison and treatment, there are hundreds of guys who could be where Dave Malone and I are right now instead of us. But the thing is, is they aren't because like you said, something about each of us, we were able to get through and carry what, what happened to each of us differently than those guys. And, um, and some of them are doing really well. Some of them are struggling and like even just making 
basic decisions is an incredible challenge. And honestly, and that, yeah. There's nothing wrong with counseling. I mean, there's nothing wrong with seeking counseling. You know, when I, you know, our youngest daughter, we knew there was an issue before she was born. We didn't know what it was, but we knew there was an issue. And so I insisted that we go to counseling and um, to prepare for delivery and uh, for this, for this child. And one of the things that our counselor said, you've got to mourn the life that you thought you were going to have, the child you thought you were going to be blessed with, so that you can now enjoy the child you're going to get. Because our child had platelet issues. She bruised easily and she has a missing bone in both of her forearms. And then, you know, we had it so easy for the first several years. And then all of a sudden we had to have a bone marrow transplant when she was five. Um, but I'm going to tell you, I, I can't, we are different people than we were before she was born. And we cannot imagine our lives without her to this day. And she's a freshman in college. I mean, she was just home for spring break. Yeah. She just went back to college and she's, you know, she has trouble doing things because of her arms. And, um, and she, I, I refer to her as my most independent dependent child because she has to have help, but she wants to do everything herself. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what, I mean, there are a lot of families that would go through that and would fail. You know, a lot of families don't survive those types of problems. And I think, you know, I used to think my wife and I were, the reason why we stuck together is because we're opposites. She's, um, she doesn't like crowds. I love crowds, but I don't think that, I don't think that anymore. I think the reason why we've been together as long as we have is because we're both religious and we've, you know, we've always attended church. Uh, when, when we dated, we'd go one Sunday to her church and one Sunday to my church. And so when we go through those difficult th- times, we would have something to lean on. Um, I think AA Alcoholics Anonymous has been so successful because part of that program believes in a supreme being. It doesn't say what it is. It just it's based on on a, 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 sub, a supreme being belief. I think that I mean we need to have more. I, I think that you're belief. hitting on a lot of the from just my. I don't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry again, but I wanted to say something in this. You uh, uh you're hitting on something that I think is is probably the the touching on on the answer to these questions that we're talking about about you know fixing you know people's criminal behavior fixing the crime problem and the mindset and so forth I've often ta- times thought whenever I was in prison I would sit and think about it you know what could you do with this place that would actually make it you know uh, do what it's supposed to do fix people that type of thing and I, I think it that, that I, I always leaned more toward this idea of like uh, I, I I read like a history of prisons and how you know and in ancient China whenever they had like Shaolin monasteries and everything everywhere how they deal with criminals but the Chinese people would just the villagers would if they had a criminal they they didn't have police officers they'd just get a couple of strong guys and go snatch the guy up and they'd bring him to the Shaolin monastery and they would just they would kick him to the monks. And they tell the monks, hey, man, you can't control this guy. He's doing this. He's doing that. And the monks would say, okay, we got him. And they would hold on to him until they fixed him, <laughs> until he was ready to walk out those doors. And they, and every time they walked out the doors, they walked out the doors, a, a very religious, deeply religious individual, very spiritual and so forth. And it may have taken them a very long time to get there, but they got there. And I, I, I really think that that's the solution that's the core solution. And I don't know, I don't know how you implement it because they've tried in Texas prisons. They, they like have these faith-based programs and all that faith-based. I, I'm not Christian. I'm Jewish, but I don't, I don't, not that I have any problem with being, would you be a Christian faith is a wonderful thing. No matter what, you know, what it is, religion is a good thing. It's, it teaches people to be better people, but any kind of, when you hear faith-based in Texas prison, that always means Christian. No, so anything you try to get involved in it whenever you're not in it, and it, it will sour you on it. They, they, they're, they're going about it the wrong way in, in, in Texas prisons, they're, but they're trying. But there's other, I've, I've heard that they base that program, that, that faith-based program, on an actual prison somewhere in South America where the prison is like what I was describing as the monastery. All the inmates there are like, most of them are have life sentences, and they really... Comprise, there's no guards in there or anything. The inmates are their own guards. 
But it's so religious that whenever they throw new guys in there, they don't have any choice but to just kind of go with the flow. There's no there's no room for them to to behave in some other way. The, where the rub comes in is is that all those guys, everybody in that country is all Catholic, and so they all have this one unified religion, and it kind of kind of yeah. But don't we? I mean, the problem we have right now is gangs are in organized crimes running a large part of our country, and they run our prisons. I mean. They're, You're right, but that doesn't mean that they they run our prisons only because whenever they get to prison, they have that they have that, that that's the structure they have to go into. You have yeah, to somehow that's break not that a structure off. to rehabilitate. It's not. It's not at all. I agree. Agree with you one hundred percent. Right, and but so one thing that I learned, I went from treatment to prison. So I kind of envisioned that when I was going. That prison wasn't going to be treatment, but I figured it was going to have a lot of the elements like there was like we always had AA meetings to attend and lots of services that we could like we could choose or or were forced to attend to in treatment. The tre- treatment in jail I or treatment in prison were very different. And the main reason that they're different was the mentality behind it, because prison the main goal of staff and everyone there is to make sure you stay in prison. Whereas in treatment, their main goal is to make sure that you come out successfully. And it was it, at the treatment facility I was at, it was really amazing how much, like I didn't even know until there was an incident that happened there where we found out that the staff, like I found out from the staff that they were like keeping eyes on all of us and like we're having meetings and we're keeping tabs on us that way. And we're actively trying to help us to work together. And I was like, wow, that's, it was amazing. And then it's, and then you go into prison and then the gangs are honestly there to, they kind of take work off the officers. Cause if the fight gangs are fighting in between each other, that's less stuff for the officers to have to do. And they're understaffed as is because that's a horrible, horrible job to be job. working in a prison. Yeah. Nobody wants to work in a prison. It's Nobody hot. wants to work there. Nobody wants to be a police officer right now. Right. And I, mean, I think it's it's a, it's about changing a lot of mentalities all at once. Like, and it's it's a big ask um, to do that. Yeah, you know, I just think we're spending you know, we're spending our money wrong, and um, I don't know what the answer is for you know the prison system and our criminal justice system and how to improve that. But, and cause we're, we're actually going in the wrong direction on our criminal justice reform from the standpoint of getting people to go to court so that we can find them innocent or guilty, get their case resolved so that we can either send them to prison or release them. We're going in the opposite direction on that. And we're doing that in the name of reform. Uh, I think we've got a coalition that's behind that. And I think part of the coalition is intent to um, de- uh, decriminalize a, a lot of crime because uh, for whatever reason, you could say it's malicious. You can say it's well-intended. Uh, but if you're, you're well-intended, you have to admit what's, what we're doing is not working. I mean, you, I mean, for the president of the United States to come out in, in his state of the union address and say crime is a 50 year low, that's just an out and out lie. Um, and you know, our urban cities absolutely know it, feel it, and they're suffering the consequences. And the ultimate irony is the very people they're saying they're going to help, those communities are the ones that are getting hurt the most because as crime goes up, they go up, it goes up more in our minority communities. And so uh, I do have hope. I have hope that things are going to change because our current course is not sustainable. I, I totally agree with that. And yeah, I, it's 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 not sustainable. Not it's about fi- it's and I think conversations like these are going to be the key to figuring out how we can, like what we can do, to to maybe find something that is sustainable, um, sure. going forward. Well, guys, I am way behind on sleep. <laughs> yes, my, so I've got to go. <laughs> Um, yeah, before, me too. Uh, before you go, you do you want to plug your podcast and where hey, people well, can find you? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah. 
This ended up a lot different than I thought it was going to. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, if y'all want to know more information about me or our um, our pod, my podcast, you can go to pbtx.com or or you can go to thebellpost.com. Uh, we have a blog, and we also I just we have a podcast that just talks about criminal justice issues, where we're trying to educate legislators, uh, legislatures, and the public on what these reforms are. So, thank you very much for having me. Thank you All so right. much for coming on the show. It's been great having you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Dave, quit talking so much. Right. <laughs> I'm saying. You can find Shakedown merch, graphic novels, and other projects at waywardpress.com. That's W A Y W O R D press.com. If you would like to support the Shakedown, get exclusive content, and watch episodes live, you can support us at patreon.com slash the shakedown like subscribe and leave a comment to give malone that inner peace he so richly deserves